Hey everybody, how we all doing? I'm Michael, joined by Alex as always. How's it going? And this is Falling Through Potholes, a podcast about video game plot lines and how they have a tendency to go off the rails. And this is part two of our series on the disastrous launch and ramifications of the Xbox One. Microsoft's attempt to follow up on their very successful system, the Xbox 360, and all the little failures that came along with it. And by little, I mean massive failures because oh boy, huge incredibly huge uh ramifications they are still feeling to this day mm-hmm. yeah, last episode was part one where we went through the history of the xbox 360 and at the start of today's episode we will give a little bit of a recap about that though if you do want to listen to that in full i i definitely do suggest you do so i think it's a pretty darn good episode and gives a lot of context to just the financial state and the stakes that were present for microsoft as the started the lead up to the xbox one yeah alex how you doing today i'm doing i'm doing okay still recording from my living room because our little power situation hasn't vastly improved oh dear Uh, but i i on the upside i have learned some interesting things about circuit breakers and ethernet power line adapters oh what have you learned uh i have learned that uh circuit breakers actually come in four types a single pole Double pole, ground, uh, GDCI, which I believe is ground direct current interrupter, and Hmm. AFCI, arc flux, or sorry, arc fault current interrupter. And Hmm. the latter of which is uh, mandated by the, I believe, the NEC to be used in bedrooms and other places where faulty electricity is likely, or faulty electronic devices are likely to cause house fires by sparking curtains or linens or things of that nature. And also, they can be very sensitive to arc faults, which is when two wires do not touch, but the Mm -hmm. current continues to jump anyway, creating an arc. Oh. Uh, So their whole purpose is to look out for that. And so, because that's kind of hard to detect, they tend to be very sensitive. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they do not like power line adapters. Oh, yeah. Like at all. They don't (laughs) care for those weird things to transmit internet data through electrical pulses and Mm -hmm. jump between circuits Hmm. don't care for him nope doesn't sound like they do (laughs) huh yeah that uh, that sounds like a real problem for you yeah so uh figure in the process of figuring that out but in the meantime other than that doing pretty good oh that's good that's good i'm not dealing with electricity you know, actually, it's actually fun that you're dealing with electricity Uh issues once and i fun i mean fun in air quotes obviously obviously yeah but yeah, no, my my day has been pretty good too. I ate a bunt cake right now mm. uh, because I hosted a Halloween party, and one of uh, one of our mutual friends asked, "Hey, you know, do you need anything for it?" I'm like, "Oh well, you know, you just get whatever you want." And I should have told him something with meat in it and not mm. sweets because mm-hmm. now I have a lot of sweets. And yep, that's, that's an issue. That's what happens during Halloween. <laughs> That is indeed what happens during Halloween. So uh, just like last week, Mm. I've decided to eat a lot of sugar and decide to talk (laughs) about uh, failing consoles. And we'll see how that ends up going. You know what? This is honestly the right mindset for this topic. It really, really is, especially because we're going to basically start out by talking about Sesame Street. So, you know. Oh, God. Yeah, (laughs) that's kind of where this starts. So this is going to be part two of what is now going to turn to a three part episode, uh, which makes us this really funny thing where this started out as a one parter, then Mm -hmm. became a two parter, then became a three parter. I have thankfully have written all three episodes now, so we don't have to worry about this somehow becoming a fourth parter unless somehow over the course of the next two hours, I find more weird stories about Australians, uh, which uh, always more. There always is, but will they be related to the Xbox One? The answer is uh, actually more likely than you yeah, think. Yeah, probably. probably. In some way. <laughs> yeah, so today's good episode is basically going to be about the development of the Xbox One up until the uh, untimely reveal of the Xbox One in May 2013. So this is going to be getting to the fireworks factory, but not quite there. But there's mm-hmm. still going to be some fun things along the way. So let's go ahead and jump in with a recap of essentially what we went over last week. Mm -hmm. In short, after Sony shot themselves in the foot with an expensive new system, the PlayStation 3, and a bunch of hubris, Microsoft swooped in with the Xbox 360, 
a system of comparable power to the PlayStation 3 with a much more appealing price point that came out of the gate just absolutely red hot, selling a ton of systems and establishing an early lead over their competitors, Sony. While Sony would eventually catch up, the Xbox 360 would get a second wind with two things. Increased multimedia capab capabilities and capacity outside of video games, with streaming services like Netflix, and the release of an impressive add-on peripheral, the motion and depth sensing camera called the Kinect. These two things, alongside a boatload of other decisions, is going to lead to the Xbox 360 getting a new audience of casual users and bringing in a ton of cash for Microsoft. This is going to set the stage for them to make some very fateful, deci fateful decisions for their upcoming system. So, Alex, it's the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. As the Xbox 360 and its console generation is starting to finally wind down, Forbes magazine published an article called X Microsoft Xbox is Winning the Living Room War. Here's why. This article begins immediately by talking about a new product for the 360's Kinect peripheral, the Kinect Sesame Street TV, a fully interactive version of the award-winning education program. Now, this thing was a really big deal back in the day. I remember even, like, genuine reviews of it raving. Yeah, yeah, because it seemed to fulfill all the potential that the Kinect could offer. Because mm -hmm. really, up until that point, a lot of the stuff that the Kinect would do is like, okay, well, you're, like, waving your hand from the camera, or you're just, like, kind of, like, trying to, like, mimic dance moves or whatnot. Mm -hmm. This is one where, well, I'll just describe what it is. You'll get an idea, I think, of why this is important. So, the game plays out similarly to an episode of Sesame Street, except the Muppets on the TV, such as Elmo, can know if a kid is reacting to them and act appropriately. Like, there's one, like, where they'll, like, throw a ball and whatnot, and mm -hmm. you make a ball-throwing motion back, and they'll catch it. And if not, then, like, they'll, like, constantly prompt you, and if you don't, then, like, another Muppet will come on and just throw the ball back to Elmo or whatever. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. the point is, though, is that it reacts to you in a way that seems very novel. Mm -hmm. Now, for both Sesame Workshop, the producers of Sesame Street, and Microsoft, this product is immediately exciting. And this is directly from the Forbes article, quote, Kids generally learn through play, and this is an opportunity to get them off the couch and involved, says Cherry Fitzpatrick, Chief Content and Distri Distribution Officer for Sesame Workshop, who has produced Sesame Street since 1969. Microsoft recognized the value of it immediately, end quote. In this same article, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft's then-CEO, backs this up. As this article goes to explain, quote, The living room is very important, says Ballmer. Ballmer, in a regulation button-down and khakis. Editor's note, I don't know what that is, but sounds it's, good. It's developer fashion. It is developer fashion, yes. Anyways, back to the article. Spends 30 minutes on just the future of Xbox. Quote, it's a place where there's a high volume of consumption of digital goods and services. So Xbox is very important, end quote. Alex, at this last episode, I kind of started to lay the groundwork that Don Matrick is going to make a lot of decisions that are mm -hmm. going to be very, very bad for Microsoft. Yes. And that a lot of the bad decisions that the Xbox One are eventually going to arrive at kind of are at his doorstep. Mm -hmm. The more I did research than this, the more that this came off is Matrick being guilty of a lot, but this being a Balmer th project through and through. Right. I mean, I think that all three hardware manufacturers kind of as a company made <laughs> the same mistake at one point or another. Yeah. Which is putting the casual market front and center as their core audience. Mm -hmm. Because yes, the casual market is obviously much larger than the quote unquote core gamer market. Yeah. And can give you a lot of money, but there it's not going to be a consistent market. Yeah. And it's not going to give you like stable revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not the ones you can count on to buy two of the three games a year. You know, for instance, like mm -hmm. year in in year out. Right. And are just on top of that very fickle in general. They'll right. they'll move from trend to trend. Like they'll definitely turn their heads if you give them something interesting. But you're not going to hold that interest. You can catch it from time to time. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you can't hold it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But at this time, Microsoft doesn't seem to realize that. Or if they do realize it, they think they can be the ones to capture it indefinitely. Mm -hmm. right. Because you see, for Balmer, this is not at all an exaggeration. 
The reign of Steve Ballmer as head of Microsoft had, up until this point, been a bit of a confusing mess. Throughout the 2000s, up to this point, Microsoft had tried and failed to be more than a, one company that made Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office, but rather a true multimedia company. Given the sheer amount of resources, talent, and will to acquire other, smaller companies, this should have been doable, and yet somehow it was still out of their grasp. It certainly wasn't for a lack of trying. An attempt to make a competing PC digital store to compete with Valve's Steam service with the clunkily named Games for Windows oh, Live was heavily derided. That was so bad. It is maybe one of the worst products I have ever seen. Like, worst designed PC just products. awful, awful design. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, just... I Having to deal with that for Fallout 3 was... It was impossible to buy DLC at certain points. Anyways, yeah. so there was that. Attempts at creating a multimedia device to compete with the iPod, the Microsoft Zune, <laughs> was discontinued in 2011, just after five years on the market. In 2010, Microsoft launched the Windows Phone. This smartphone, done in a partnership with Nokia, that eventually would, would result in Microsoft just straight up buying their mobile phone division, would eventually fail 10 years later which I did not even realize it lasted 10 years. Yeah, that's surprising. I have heard that those phones weren't bad. They were legitimately good phones, like with good functionality and right. everything. They were just branded after the second most boring product that Microsoft puts out. <laughs> right. They were also the death knell for Windows 8. They were, yes. Because they forced Windows 8's UI to be based on mobile devices, which made it awful for desktop uh -huh. machines. Yep. Yes, it did. <laughs> Boy, I can't wait till we get talk about the reveal of the Xbox One. <laughs> yeah, not irrelevant. <laughs> not irrelevant, as it turns out. <laughs> God, they, they were so obsessed with squares. They really were. They're like, Windows. What if we had a bunch of Windows? Yeah, you all it, like Windows, right? Website and... This is a real aside, but man, mm -hmm. website and UI design for like like online functionality around this time was just so bad. It was. Everything was trying to be mobile and tablet related. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, everything is like, here's just a bunch of giant boxes. And it's like, this doesn't work well on anything. Nope. Nope. Ugh. Terrible. Terrible. I've noticed that most websites are now starting to revert back from that finally. And it's really good. It's really nice. Yes. It, it's We're finally hitting the era of like, if you need to have a mobile interface, you need a separate mobile interface. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's great. Thank you for doing that. So all these failures led to an odd stagnation at Microsoft. While Bomber's time at CEO would see Microsoft eventually double their profits, the stock price of Microsoft would be $55.75 at the start of his time at the company in the year 2000. When Balmer left the position on February 4th, 2014, the stock price was around $37.60 a share. Through all of this, there was one outlier. One thing that proved Microsoft could be more than a software company, the Xbox. For the year 2011, Microsoft's Xbox division brought in roughly about $4.95 billion, $4 billion of revenue. Now, not profit, obviously, mm -hmm. revenue, but still, right. that's a pretty significant chunk. Uh, that accounted for roughly about 70% of all revenue that Microsoft generated for the fiscal year of 2011. So certainly not insignificant. Right. Now... The breakdown of this is that 61% of that was through sales of hardware and accessories, so stuff like the 360 itself and the Kinect, 20% mm -hmm. through hardware and software royalties, so like third-party sales of like Just Dance or whatever, 17% of that was through Xbox Live Gold subscriptions. So yeah, a pretty substantial number given the size and breadth of the company. However, for Balmer and, and Entertainment and Devices Division head Don Matrick, this wasn't a real exciting thing about the Xbox 360. It was how the consumer was using their machines. In 2011, Forrester Research published findings regarding U.S. homes and how they accessed online video on a TV. It found that an increasing amount of U.S. homes were using more devices across the board to accomplish this. So outside of just like their cable boxes and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, they were doing things like... Uh, 5.9% of households were using set-top boxes, such as the Apple TV or Roku, to accomplish this in 2011, uh, compared to 2.5% in 2010, so more than double. Mm -hmm. PCs directly connected to TV uh, rose from that being done on for 10.9% of households in 2010 to 13.6% in 2011. Right, which is still way higher than I would expect anyone to do that. 
Yeah, right? I, like I a, remember... It's a ahead. very niche thing to do. It is. Like, I, for the longest time, actually had a dedicated old desktop computer mm-hmm. that was doing that. And, yeah, no, a lot of people, like, when I would host, like, meetups or, or whatever over in my place, people would, like, comment on that. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the seeing of that amount, I was like, huh, I wasn't alone. Yeah. But the kings of this were video game consoles. In an all-encompassing category, including the Wii, 360, and PlayStation 3, that saw basically saw the share of this uh, particular instance rise from 18 to 18.4% in 2011, compared to 14.2% in 2010. Now, this obviously didn't mean that 18% of U.S. households used their 360 to view Netflix on their mm-hmm. TV, but it did indicate that the 360 was filling a need for some households, and it's most likely a significant amount. Mm-hmm. These households were also potentially monetizable, as evidenced by the number of people subscribed to Xbox Live Gold. In 2011, Xbox Live Gold had 17 million subscribers. Now, this was larger than some major cable providers, like Time Warner Cable, the mm-hmm. then, then number three cable provider in the United States, uh, which had, I believe, 15 million at that time. Though it was smaller than Comcast Cable at 22 right. million and DirecTV at 33 million subscribers. However, if you combine Xbox numbers with the amount of unpaid Xbox Live accounts, that number rises to 40 million potentially paying customers. There it is. Yep. This was a huge untapped potential for Microsoft that was theoretically only going to grow with the release of their new console. All they needed to do was find out how they could do two things. How could they get people to pay for Xbox Live Gold? And two, how can they peel away customers from people like Direct TV? Now, for Microsoft, these efforts had already started. Uh, Microsoft had already begun the work of trying to convince, and I believe actually successfully convincing Comcast Mm -hmm. um, and Verizon to give people the option of using an Xbox 360 instead of a set-top box when they signed up for like their internet Mm -hmm. or TV uh, subscriptions. Uh, And he even cut the Xbox 360's price from $199 to $99 US. Hmm. For Microsoft, there's, this seems like an obvious bet. The average American was putting in nearly 35 hours a week watching TV, resulting in nearly $91 billion a year in subscriptions and an additional $72 billion of advertising revenue for cable companies, which was simply too big of a number to ignore. Now, additional moves that Microsoft is going to make in June of 2011 include uh, announcing that the 360 was going to support 24-7 live programming from all ESPN channels. I believe it was going to be as part of Xbox Live Gold. Mm-hmm. Zune Music was also renamed to Xbox Music. An additional Xbox branding was beginning to make its way onto PCs, slowly replacing games for Windows Live. However, all these were stopgap measures, because Microsoft realized that if they wanted to radically change the industry, they would need to begin work on a new console built from the ground up to support this vision. Mm-hmm. And so Project Durango was born. <laughs> So bad. It's so every name they come up with is the worst. It really is. I like for, for what it's worth. I like Natal, mm-hmm. but yeah, Dur- okay. Durango is silly. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see exactly what Microsoft's doing here, right? Yes. Xbox is successful, so Xbox needs to go everywhere. Right. People are using it to watch TV. We need to find a way to shoehorn TV on here, even by even if it means cutting deals with like Comcast. Mm-hmm. Like you can see. Where they're going, you can see how they're seeing the, God, was it, $160 billion of revenue just around TV mm-hmm. and just being like, we can get on all that. We right. have to get on all that. So this is, this is a common foible in tech mm-hmm. because the number of cases where a company has successfully and intentionally engineered mm-hmm. a product to spearhead the new frontier – of tech use by consumers Mm -hmm. is vastly outnumbered by the number of times they've done it accidentally. Yeah. Like tech will just be used. However, people realize they can use it. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to intentionally create new tech products and have people like jump on board with them and use them the way you expect. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's like how every few years you have somebody who tries to make like the WeChat for the United States or whatnot, uh-huh. the everything app, like right. 
like uh, Elon Musk is trying to do right now or Facebook tried to, I guess Meta technically tried to right. do a few years ago or like speaking of Meta trying to push the metaverse and whatnot as a new right. way to do things. Like these very intentional and very expensive efforts that ultimately ended up being nothing. And then right. you have people like TikTok just kind of show up and just like, look at this. This is a kind of fun way to post videos. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it yeah, blows up. It becomes the biggest thing. Or like, you know, that, that WeChat experiment or project fails because everyone in the U.S. goes, well, we already have Twitter. Yeah. yeah which we is have tw- not designed for that, but it's being <laughs> used for that. And yeah. will continue to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it it's this happens so often, and you would think that eventually tech companies would kind of learn. No. But unfortunately, <laughs> they have stockholders and stock yes. and stock prices they're beholden to. And that means they have to take big swings and do really, really stupid things. Right. Which a middle sorry, by the way is ridiculous in and of itself because you might hear that oh under balmer's watch the stock price in microsoft dipped by 12 dollars a share Mm. over like 10 years that stock price is garbage it doesn't mean anything it's completely speculative software companies are entirely speculative in their value Mm -hmm. It, it is they entirely are but at the same time, yeah, that was that is commonly pointed to. Like, and that is a number that is commonly pointed to to point out the failure of the of the Balmer's ring like, right. over uh, over Microsoft. But yeah, you're also totally right because, as I mentioned, he also doubled profits at Microsoft, uh-huh. a yeah. company that was incredibly profitable <laughs> when he took over. Right. He yeah. did very many successful things, but the investors were like, "Oh, that's you could make more money." I don't know. You just keep doing a good job of Windows and Office. <laughs> But you got to do the new thing. Yeah, just just break in and eat iTunes' lunch. How hard could that be? Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Make, make a mobile phone. It'll be cool. It, it is very telling that, like, Microsoft <laughs> stock price, I think it's like $250 now a share is like right. that. And their current ju- the current thing they're doing right now is just burning billions <laughs> of dollars buying buying not even smaller companies no massive companies big enough that the F uh, FTC is like I don't I don't know if we can let you do that yeah yeah and there's no guarantee of profitability going no, forward but... none whatsoever <laughs> they go, but you did the impressive thing so here's <laughs> more money yeah it's. The stock market is an incredibly, incredibly silly thing. The tech yes. industry is an incredibly also, silly yes. thing. Which is why it's so fun to talk about. Indeed. So, getting back to Durango. Mm-hmm. We don't know exactly when Durango became a thing, but rumors started circulating as early as February of 2012, and we know as early as um, uh, as May 2012, third-party publishers such as Electronic Arts got a hold of some sort of prototype hardware meant to simulate what Durango was ultimately going to be. It was literally just like a PC tower that they just stuffed parts into, and he mm-hmm. went, "This is this is our target, more or less." At the at the time, however, details were pretty scant about what the console was going to be capable of, and to this day, the overall development of Durango is shrouded in mystery. In fact, just a lot of things about the early dates of Xbox One are things that Microsoft would rather you forget. <laughs> yeah. They have a they have a fun documentary about the history of Xbox that gets to like the development of Xbox One, and they go, yeah, maybe the TV part was a bad idea. Anyways, Phil Spencer then took over, and they were great. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very funny. Um, it's also very funny because they got Don Matrick back to talk about it. Oh and man! And it's like, oh yeah, you you really can't talk about the, the ways <laughs> he's going to shoot himself in the foot yep. if you want him on there. It makes sense now. So yeah, uh, details are scant. That being said, we can gleam a lot by their public moves that they made during the year 2012, as well as the fact that during that time, despite their best attempts, Microsoft was an incredibly leaky ship. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long before bombshell articles started to drop about what the vision of the system was going to be. Before we get to that, let's take a look at some of these big public swings that they were taking. For Durango, Microsoft wanted to capitalize on the increasing use of video game consoles as a way to watch TV and movies. Now, rumors began to circulate, and by rumors, I mean more like outward lusting almost, Uh that Microsoft was aggressively courting an executive at one of the major television networks to helm a new initiative within the company. 
In June 2012, they made an announcement that surprised no one. They hired Nancy Tellum to head their newly created Xbox Entertainment Studios. Alex, you remember Xbox Entertainment Studios? I'm trying to remember if they released a single product. You know, they are going to release a lot more than you would think. Mm. <laughs> like, I think five projects of theirs are eventually going to get out. Wow. Yeah, I did. It was I a can't lot more than I thought. any of them. Oh, don't worry. We'll talk about some of them because they're silly. But uh, getting into uh, Xbox Entertainment Studios and talking about Nancy Tellum herself, actually, because Nancy, Nancy's a very interesting figure. Mm hmm. Uh, born to a Jewish family in Danville, California, she got a law degree from the University of California, Hastings. Mm. Now, while she did a pretty good job as a lawyer, that was not her true passion. From basically being a little girl on, uh, she found television absolutely fascinating. After five years of working as a business litigator, she managed to get hired at Columbia Pictures Television before moving on to various companies uh, and settling eventually at Lorimar Television. And this was back in the 80s. Now, when Lorimar merged with Warner Brothers Television in 1989, she went to work for them. And that's where she met Les Moonves, the head of Warner Brothers Television and famously terrible person. Uh -huh. Now, Les seemed to really like Nancy for one reason or another, because when he later jumped ship to head CBS Entertainment, he brought Nancy with him. When he later became president of CBS, he appointed Nancy as his successor and also made her the president of CBS Network Television Entertainment Group. It's from that position that she oversaw shows such as CSI, Survivor, and Everybody Loves Raymond. And she was at the time only the second woman to ever hold a top entertainment post at a major network. So in my research on Nancy Telb, I found scant little about her personal life or any controversies, which given she worked in Hollywood, honestly speaks volumes about her character. Yeah, impressive. Yeah. She remained in her position until 2010 when she resigned to take an advisory role at CBS, something that generated zero controversy. Because it sounds like that she just was like, I'm basically at the top where I'm at. Less is not going anywhere. Uh, might as well just do something else. Mm -hmm. My point of all of this is that she's an incredible gift for Microsoft, of somebody mm -hmm. with absolutely impressive credentials, and the fact that her pursuit of their pursuit of Telem was a op very open secret, and for honestly good reason. Mm -hmm. Now, why she took the job is another question, and I don't really have an answer for that. Once again, it could be she was just at the absolute tippy top she could have gone, and less, less Moonves died, or say she hung around until 2019 and he got into an incredibly uh, open sexual harassment lawsuit. Uh, she probably wasn't going to be going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It might just be a case of that she wanted a different challenge. And to be fair, when <laughs> one of the largest... Uh, technology companies comes and says, hey, we want you to start a new initiative for TV and we're going to basically write you a blank check. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to see why she would jump ship to that. Now, one thing I could say about this job is that it wasn't going to just be about managing, say, like Xbox Music or Netflix on the upcoming Durango. Mm -hmm. But rather, her job was to do something ambitious. Create new original television programming for Microsoft to be featured on their new platform. This would also include interactive entertainment meant to take advantage of the unique features of a new version of the Kinect, one that would come with every system. As for what Xbox Entertainment Studios was going to produce, this was going to include quite a variety of things. This includes a sports reality show called Every Street United about street soccer in various countries, a documentary about the 1980s video game crash called Atari Game Over, which did come out, mm. and a remake of the BBC show Blake's Seven. There's also going to be a show based on the video game Conker's Bad Fur Day that oh, never God. got released. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, it would have been terrible. And also live specials such as the Miss Teen USA 2014 beauty pageant, which did come out. Okay. And of course, there was going to be plenty of content from the Sesame Workshop. I believe there was four or five different programs that were actually in development for the Durango. Now, for most 2012, Durango would continue to be developed quietly. And by quietly, I mean almost immediately bombshell <laughs> articles started to drop about its development and features. So starting on January 2012, the video game website Kotaku published an article by Stephen Totillo concerning industry insiders at Microsoft who claimed three big things about the upcoming console. One, it would use Sony's proprietary Blu-ray discs. 
Previously, the Xbox 360 used their own proprietary format, the HD DVD, that was, I think that was like a seventh as big of a, as a Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, needless to say, the Blu-ray disc is, ended up being the standard going forward. So this was just them aligning themselves with the industry standard. Two, it was going to introduce a second generation version of the Kinect that would contain its own processor like originally intended. But perhaps the biggest thing was this bombshell. The next Xbox would have some sort of anti-used game system. Yeah. This is going to be something that's going to dog them throughout the next two episodes. Mm -hmm. So the reselling of games or used games has always been a perceived problem of various publishers in the gaming industry. But in the lead up to 2012, this was, this was beginning to seem much more threatening to their ongoing business. This was because starting in 2008, for the first time, physical sales of new games, not digital, stopped rising. They actually started to fall. Uh, they fell from $10.5 billion in sales to $9.59 billion in 2010. However, used game sales continued to pick up the slack, continuing slow growth from to about $2.2 billion in 2010. They had like a very consistent 3% growth like literally every year. Mm -hmm. Now, if these trends continued, it was expected that by 2020, used game sales would account for $4.4 billion in sales compared to $9.2 billion for new physical games. These numbers certainly didn't escape the nose of retailers. GameStop was estimated to have near, or nearly double the amount of profits from their used game sales compared to new releases. And in fact, the big rise for their success and their gobbling up of other companies like EB Games and whatnot mm -hmm. was on the backs of this. Mm -hmm. And companies such as Walmart, Best Buy, and Toys R Us were starting to get into the used game market. Even the convenience store chain 7-Eleven began to show interest <laughs> in this market. You remember when 7-Eleven sold video games? Barely. <laughs> yeah, it didn't last long for them, but it was a very funny time when that happened. Yeah, I, I don't frequently keep up to date on what 7-Eleven does or does not sell. <laughs> but I do vaguely recall hearing about that. Yeah, for me, it's usually like what sort of like new malt liquor is on the mm -hmm. market. And mm -hmm. also, did anybody get poisoned by the hot dogs recently? <laughs> right. That's usually about as far as 7-Eleven news goes for me. But mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was a big deal for them back in the day. So Microsoft appeared to be working on a solution to this problem, costing parts of the video game industry a ton of money, specifically the parts of the video game industry Microsoft cared about. Right. Now, this announcement is going to make too many waves at first. But it's certainly going to be a harbinger of things to come. What wasn't shared in this article was the full extent of Microsoft's plans for the Durango, and we're going to get through 2012 without any other major leaks. However, with, the Microsoft, with Microsoft's plan to announce and release Durango in 2013, the chattering and rumor mongering started back up. Mm -hmm. And by rumor mongering, I mean employees just started talking directly to the top. <laughs> Kotaku is going to be basically like the secondary main character in these like next two episodes. Yeah. Because the two-headed dragon of Stephen Totillo, actually three-headed dragon of Stephen Totillo, Luke Plunkett, and Jason Schreier are just going to do fantastic mm -hmm. reporting. This back when back when Kotaku actually did reporting. Right. Oh, good stuff. Oh, the days. The days. So on February 11th, 2013, Kotaku published an article by Stephen Totillo and Luke Plunkett that highlighted a few interesting things. One, there's going to be new controllers. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, and uh, most importantly, it's the new system is going to require the new Kinect to be connected to Durango, or otherwise the system wouldn't work at all. Awesome. Not not so good. This was required because the Kinect would always be on. This... <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Now, this article is definitely going to make waves. Mm-hmm. It's going to make such waves that I believe five days after this, Sony's just going to come out and say, oh, hey, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it is. Um, it, this is this is going to start some major issues for Microsoft. Right. What's funny is that this is not at first anyways, not even going to be the biggest problem for them. Like it's mm -hmm. only going to get worse and worse right. from here. Now, how this even came to their knowledge is that this, because like this was also released like a, with a bunch of like system specs as well, mm -hmm. and they were provided by an anonymous source named Super Day. <laughs> Day is being spelled capital D, lowercase a, capital E. And I am sorry, Alex. We need to take a Super Day tangent. Alrighty. Because 
Super Day is going to be responsible for dumping not only a bunch of information about the upcoming Xbox One, but the PlayStation 4 as well. Mm. ID also tried to hack Activision Blizzard. Mm. So, Super Day is a weird hacker guy who is probably from Australia, which the fact that I have to say he's probably from Australia. Right. And should just basically tell you everything we need to know about how much we kind of know about this guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do know he was residing in Australia at one point, and we'll get to why later. Now, he was known for making wild claims to various gaming journalism outlets about upcoming games and other projects. Like, he said he had a copy of Homeland, uh, not Homeland, uh, Homefront 2 mm. uh, back in, like, 2012. That's mm -hmm. a game that came out in 2016, so most likely not, honestly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he also claimed that he had played Sleeping Dogs 2, which a game that was in active development at one True. point. True. So. Yes, it was. Possibly believable on that one. But the point is that a lot of stuff he would say was hard to prove definitively. Mm -hmm. That is until he provided Kotaku a 90 page document detailing Sony's plans for the PlayStation 4 that lined up with their more credible services, uh, sources, I should say. Mm -hmm. He then followed this up with information about Durango and even somehow put up a Durango dev kit for sale on eBay multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> Now, some of the one of these eventually did get sold. The others ended up getting pulled. Mm -hmm. But the uh, point is, is that he basically put himself forward as this cool hacker dude who just knew how to get information and whatnot. Right. Now, how did he go about doing all this cool hacker stuff? Well, it's because companies are run by humans and humans are dumb. Right. He did less hacking and more just social engineering. Mm -hmm. and by social engineering, I mean, honestly, that's like an insult to actual con artists who do that. Right. Yeah. Because it turns out the majority of the time, he was able to get access online by just claiming he was a developer. <laughs> <laughs> and not just like an indie game developer either. In the case of getting the dev kits, he would just fill out a form and basically claim he was like Rockstar. <laughs> and then they would just ship it to like a random location that wasn't his house. He would just show up there, pick up the kits, and there we go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, amazing. Hey, if you want to get into like data crime, humans mm -hmm. are the easiest vulnerability point. They absolutely are. By oh, a they absolutely billion are. percent. <laughs> humans are dumb, and all you gotta do is cast a wide enough net, and you'll get to get mm -hmm. one person eventually. Yep. Yeah. Now it should be noted that none of this was ever proven. Kotaku tried to like follow this up and he was very vague about the details. He eventually switched that apparently it's a friend one of his American friends who did this. Mm-hmm. The point is, we do know that a dev kit was put on sale. We know it did get sold. So we know that at the very least. Um, and we know that the information gave about Durango and the PS4 specs were largely correct. And honestly, regardless if it was true or not, it was true enough that Western Australian authorities raided his house. Super Day also claimed that a person from the FBI was with them. That was never mm -hmm. confirmed. But what they was confirmed is that they did take his computers, his phone, and a penis-shaped cup. Sure. Yeah, because why not? Yeah. Now, no charges came about him having any Xbox material, but they did try find child exploitation material of some sort, so he got charged uh... with that. Yeah. This this deal, this this is the reason why I can't take a tangent, because this uh, just goes places. Boy, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, I don't know what happened after that. He basically just said his life is ruined and just dropped off the internet about this. And um, I, I don't wasn't able to pursue this further because attempting to look up what happened with that, uh, well, depending on what, how you word things in Google, you get some very interesting warning screens. Right. So Makes uh, sense. Decent chance I'm on a watch list. I didn't <laughs> see anything illegal. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying be careful what you put into Google. Yeah. So... Anyways, the Kinect stuff was a bit alarming because the first generation Kinect was always a bit divisive for the Xbox community. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, another rumor popped up that was seemingly confirmed by Kotaku on April 4th, 2013. Durango would require an internet connection to start games. As per the source in the article quote, if there was, isn't a connection, no games or apps can be started. If the connection is interrupted, then after a period of time, currently three minutes, I remember correctly, the game slash app is suspended and the network troubleshooter started. Kotaku then followed this up by saying every person the, they've talked to internally at Microsoft was incredulous, predicting a fiasco and saying broadly that they detected hubris in a Microsoft riding high off the Xbox 360's incredible post-connect sales performance, 
and intensified interest in Microsoft's part to position the system as an entertainment device to not emphasize games as significantly as they had with past Microsoft consoles. So it should be stated that always online functionality is just kind of like the current trend. It is. For it video games is. right now, whether it's for anti-piracy or for like shoving online functionality down your throat to increase retention and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that always sticks out in my mind about that at this time period is Diablo 3. Yeah. And it's disastrous launch that no one was able to play because it was always on, it required always online oh, and the yeah. servers just got overloaded immediately and died mm -hmm. and no one could play it. And it's punctuated in my mind about someone referring to Max Payne 3, a game that had come out to vastly smaller fanfare that same day mm -hmm. and was presumed to just be like eaten by Diablo 3 and someone posting, I bet that one guy who bought Max Payne 3 is feeling real good right now. <laughs> and it was me. I was that one guy. You're that, you're that one guy? Yeah. Max Payne 3 is a fun game. Yeah, Max Bad writing, fine. but fun game. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly fine game. Perfectly yes. fine game. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. No, the, the thing about a lot of things we're going to talk about with Xbox mm -hmm. One, the, honestly, that's just the industry standard now. It is. But to build it into your console... Despite the active, ongoing catastrophes every company doing it is experiencing, mm -hmm. is like sheer hubris. Like, what, do you think it's just not going to happen to you? Yeah, right? You, you think you're not going to make the same mistakes? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we're going to get into this more next episode, but mm -hmm. at, after a certain point, people are just going to become numb to it anyways. Yeah. Like... Microsoft's going to do it first, and they're going to fail the hardest, mm -hmm. and and everyone else is just going to just quietly implement it in other right. ways. Like, I mean, recently, like I was on a train trying to play Tears of the Kingdom on my mm -hmm. Nintendo Switch, but I bought a new Switch, and so I was playing it on there, and I had to authenticate every twenty four hours. Right. And it's like, it's like ah, you gotta be kidding! It's a single player game. I bought it. It's on my profile, but yeah, it's good example there, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is bad, right? Mm -hmm. People are upset, and the system is nowhere close to being out yet. So what does Microsoft do? Okay, they, they got to have a response to this. And right. Alex, first they're going to, oh shit, oh fuck, oh no, one of their employees is on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Oh no, oh, oh no. Okay, okay, here we go. So, same day, <laughs> same day this article comes out. Adam Orth, creative director at Xbox, decided to send some tweets to a friend about the brewing controversy. Now, he has some takes. Hey, funny, funny note. You remember when I said that Twitter isn't designed for personal communication? Yep. Here's, an Here's a good a example. Here's the consequence. <laughs> Not even DMs, too. It's no, just, just on yeah. the timeline. Because <laughs> who actually knows what the difference between posts and DMs on Twitter is? It is going to take people a good five years from now before they finally get it. Mm-hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take multiple Twitter main characters before they get really, that Really? Oh, boy. <laughs> so, here's an uh, exchange between Orth and his friend. Orth, sorry, I don't get the drama about having an always-on console. Every device is always on now. That's the world we deal in. Hashtag deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. God, I love user-driven hashtags so much. Oh, they are so good. They are so good. <laughs> His friend later replied, you live in L.A., SF, Seattle, very connected places. Try living in Janesville, uh, uh, Wisconsin, or Blacksburg, Virginia. Orth then mm -hmm. replies, why on earth would I live there? Great. Oh, that's oh, it's so good. Mm. Oh. oh, it's so good. Well, now it's a real problem. <laughs> yep, little, little bit of an issue. Yeah. So, to Microsoft just tell people, hey, don't bother buying our product if you live in boonfuck nowhere. Yeah, a real, I'm sorry you live in a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> let, me in, let me imply you the place you live in is a shithole. That's oh, great. Oh, man. Boy, it sure would be a shame if Google would do some stupid crap to mirror this in like five years. Yeah, right? Oh, God, the stadia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So now it's a real problem. Microsoft immediately apologizes for this and immediately states that he have not made any announcements about our product roadmap and we have no further comment. Mm 
mm-hmm. which combined with Ort's comments means that Always Online has now been basically confirmed. Pretty much. Congrats. So Orth is going to leave the company shortly thereafter, and now there's even more anger at Microsoft. So Microsoft decides we got to do something about this. Mm-hmm. We have a solution. We're going to send an internal email to our own Xbox team clarifying what the system was capable of. Not to the public. Right. Yeah. Hopefully, no, not, ho- not to the public. Hopefully this won't get leaked. Definitely should not be leaked. That would be really bad if it got leaked. It would be very bad. So here's what the leaked email said. Uh-huh. Quote, Durango was designed to deliver the future of entertainment while engineered to be tolerant of today's internet. There are a number of scenarios that our users expect to work without an internet connection. Those include, but not limited to, playing a Blu-ray disc, watching live TV, and yes, playing single-player games. And yes? And yes. That's how it's worded. Really setting a tone here. Okay. Yeah, in an internal email of all things. Like, I would actually expect Mm. that in a press release to be a little flippant. Right. But no, internal email. Okay. Yeah. So, once again, this got leaked. And now fans were very confused why Microsoft felt the need to clarify to their own team what the system was going to do. Mm -hmm. People who should already know, by the way. Yep. And not the public at large. Oh, and they're not going to comment on this in any real way, shape, or form either. Great. So, so this is what information people had regarding the issue of Ollie's Online was about. All right. But don't worry. Don't worry. Microsoft's like, all questions will be answered on May 21st, 2013 as Microsoft plans to unveil their new console to the public, and all will be answered, which is why on May 21st, hours before the unveiling, Microsoft let Wired take a look at the console and answer questions about the used game market and always online, Mm -hmm. to which they then told them that the console didn't always need to be online, but that each game had to be installed on the console and would require one-time online authentication. And if the disk was installed anywhere else, a new user would have to pay a fee for a second authentication essentially blocking used game sales. Also, this means the console technically needs to be online, if not always. Right. Oh. Oh, well, okay. It is this tone deafness that video game companies are so universally guilty of. Oh, yeah. Which is, people are shouting at you about two things. One is they don't want to constantly ask your permission to play the video game that they paid you for. Or the machine that they paid you for. Mm. But the other is like, they ask, okay, so does this disrupt the used game market? And Microsoft goes, yeah, of course it does. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) Because to Microsoft, the used game market is a huge problem. But to their consumers, it's an asset and something that they're used to doing. Yeah, right? Like... Going back to those figures, like, yeah, nine and a half billion dollars for new games, two and a half billion dollars for used game sales. Right. And like, you go like, well, okay, it's, you know, little under a third, like, who cares, right? But then you think about it, it's like, oh, well, those games are being sold for like a third. So it's actually more like the same amount of games almost being sold as new games. Yeah. Which means a lot of people are buying used games and are going to be very upset about this. Right. But to Microsoft, like, they might as well answer that question, turn to the side and go, you're welcome, investors, Mm -hmm. and then turn back to their consumers and go, oh, you're still here? Yeah, right? (laughs) We were talking to our friends, the stockholders, and our third-party publishers. (laughs) Who let you in, you rabble? (laughs) Go home and buy our product, swine. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And they did this, like... The same day they're going to announce their new product. <laughs> it's, this is not going to be the first time in this this story, too, by the way, that they are mm-hmm. going to decide to just handicap themselves right before they announce something exciting. Right. <laughs> and then be like, why are people booing? <laughs> so to recap, right, Microsoft is about to announce their what Project Durango is going to be. But in the meantime, they're having to deal with the controversy over used game sales, the potential they're being blocked, whether or not the system is actually always online. And if it is always online, how often does it have to authenticate? Mm. What can you actually do with that? Is there anything you could do offline? A brewing controversy on social media that they haven't really quite quelled that has made them look out of touch and unconcerned with how the general public feels. And finally, just all the stuff with the Kinect about something that could potentially be always on and also just required for the console. Yeah, like we didn't really touch on that, but the always online comes with another question of, hey, is the Kinect always online? 
Well, they're going to claim no. Uh huh. Notice how I said the word claim, and maybe yeah. next episode we'll find out what that means. Mm. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's not gonna be good. It's not good. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so yeah, they're having to deal with all these controversies while Sony's just like over on their side. They've already announced the PlayStation Four back in February. They're mm-hmm. like, all right, yeah, they're just saying a bunch of stuff. We're just gonna be silent over here. Mm-hmm. And that is the state that of the industry and Microsoft's Xbox at this point. And next episode, we're going to start by going over their announcement and then the fallout that happens afterwards. And who oh boy, <sighs> is it going to just be one after another as they just consistently fall onto a bed of nails onto on off of building onto a ton of bricks with just roll down a hill Go into the explosive factory. The explosive factory blows up and then they drown. Hey, hey, people in PR, knowing your audience at any given moment is really important. It is really, really important. You yeah. need to read the room and not the last room you were in, the one you're in right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 If if people are being very I know sometimes we overblow social media, but if everybody on social media is like doing hashtag deal with it, mm-hmm. you may have made a mistake. <laughs> you you maybe need to do something to back off. This is maybe the one time I say you probably should lie. Yeah, honestly. I, I got to say about Microsoft, or, almost never or, lies during this. Yeah, that's that's true. And maybe they should. Or just shut up. Yeah, that's actually probably the bigger thing. <laughs> Like, you don't always have to lie. Sometimes it's enough to just just shut up. Yeah, that's probably the better answer. D- do the No Man's Sky Hello Games way of just being like, we're just going to just shut up now and eventually yep. put out something good. Yeah. And that worked out great for them. Turns out, yeah. Yeah. But that lesson hadn't been learned quite yet, unfortunately. But yeah, that's what we're going to be dealing with next time. Alex, how are you feeling? I, I feel good. I'm... As I mentioned last time, I owned an Xbox One. I, in fact, bought one, pre- I believe, pretty close to launch, or maybe it was the year after. Hmm. So I've got a chip on my shoulder about the Xbox One, and yep. I'm I'm looking forward to really getting into its run-up and release, because, oh boy, this is <laughs> literally just the tip of things. Oh, yeah. Man, it's gonna... I, it's I don't gonna blame you. Bad. I don't think there's ever been a system that's just been more disappointing. No, I... Like, even other systems that have been failures at least were interesting failures. Like, Yeah. Like, the Atari 7800 at least was interesting, mm-hmm. right? Or, like, or like, predictable. Like, yeah. you could see it coming and be like, that's gonna just flop. Yeah, there's no way this thing is gonna do anything. But yeah, with the Xbox One, it's just like... Wow, you just released a system that is weaker than the, than your competitors and more expensive, and yep. also is has every controversy under the sun, and just with it? has nothing interesting going on with its library. Oh come on now, what? Why some Rome didn't do it for you? You know, I can't say that it did. I can't <laughs> say that it did. Uh, I like how both the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One are going to have a game that's, like, very beautiful looking. Mm. And the most nothing thing that ever exists. I forgot about that one. Oh, the order? Yeah. I literally forgot about it. I remember that game exists maybe Mm -hmm. once every two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Digital Foundry did a good retrospective on it recently. Mm. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, wow, that game does look amazing. It does. It's beautiful. It's not a game. It is not. No, it is. Um, it is a sub Gears of War one third person shooter. Yeah. That is which, mostly walking and looking at. Wow, that is a pretty wall. Yep. Pretty much. Oh, amazing. But yeah, next time we are going to go over once again, the, the Xbox one, its announcement it's the lead up to E3 and how Sony's just going to rip their heart out in a way that is maybe the most satisfying way I've ever seen one company do that to another. It's very good. Although, spoiler, they're lying. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely are. <laughs> but once again, that'll be for next time. In the meantime, if you want to listen to other episodes, so the, if you want to listen to other episodes of Fallen Through Plot Holes, 
Go to ftv.podme.com or search for Fallen Through Plot Holes on your podcast service of choice. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube as well. Just search for Fallen Through Plot Holes and you'll find us. Uh, and you also, you know, comment and leave us, you know, notes on there or at our email address at fallenthroughplotholes at gmail.com, which can be located in the description. Uh, you should definitely tell us about what your favorite dumb uh, console, uh, con- like fake console name was. Was it Dolphin? Are you a Katana fan? How about Neptune? Neptune was good. Neptune is good. I, I still like Dolphin. Yeah, Dolphin was good. They should. I, I love the simplicity of the Nintendo GameCube as a mm-hmm. name. It is right. says it, exactly it what sense. it is. Yeah, it makes total sense. But like, man, we got all excited for Dolphin, and then they were like, and here's the GameCube. And you're like, <laughs> all right. I, like, I get it. But like, yeah. Th- then it would do it again to us with Revolution, and then we... Oh, God. Oh, that was the worst one. Yeah. That was like from the best to the worst. Yeah, and, like, the general aesthetic of the system would not have supported Revolution, I think, for, like, the mark they were going after. But at the same time, that was good, man. Yeah. (sighs) But, yeah, write us an email or leave a comment how you, which one you you like. Or just make it your own. Actually, actually, I'm I'm sorry. I feel like Scorpio to Xbox One X might be worse. Oh, Scorpio was good. Scorpio was good. Damn. What, was it Scorpio or Scarlet or both? I think Scarlet was for the S and Scorpio was for the X. Right, okay. Yeah, because they had, they had separate ones. Right, okay. Hmm. Both both good dev project names to just what? Okay, what about Orbis? That's stupid. <laughs> that is a dumb word. Yeah, I forgot the PlayStation 4 was codenamed Orbis for the longest time. <laughs> That's a dumb word. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's <laughs> Not sure that's a real word. I'm not the most learned man, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I've never heard that word before. That doesn't yeah, sound real. It doesn't sound real. I can't think of a language that would allow that word to exist. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, this was a really long way to end the episode, but yes. Alex, thank you for doing this with me as always. Of course. And take care, everybody. Take care.